Thank you very much. I try my best. Um, yeah, I thank you very much as organizers for the invitation and also thank you to my colleagues for the great discussions over the last days. Before I start with my presentation, I would like to introduce myself. This is working. So I tried that microphone. I'm a senior researcher at the Austrian Academy of Sciences um, here at the Institute of Social Anthropology. I'm teaching at two universities, uh, the University of Natural Resources and the University of Technology, both based in Vienna, and I'm architect civil engineer. And some publication which uh, are uh, close uh, related to my presentation today. These are the two volumes, Earth Construction and Tradition, and uh, one publication um, on the Open Air Museum in Bad Tatzmannsdorf. Uh, this is in southern Burgenland, it's not far from here, and the traditional architecture there is very close to what uh, we could see yesterday, partially at least. And um, there is uh, one of uh, the scientific papers uh, which I would recommend in uh, relation to my topic of today because it has uh, to do with earth, earth and architecture as well. And uh, it's the influence of clay on the pre-modern building culture in Austria. To mention two projects which are about to start, both starting in uh, 2024. One is a European Union financed project, Climate and the Transformation of Architecture. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary project on ecology, technology and anthropology. And the second project uh, is uh, financed by the Austrian Science Fund. And it's on the spatial concepts and regional topography in the Western Himalayas, where we will uh, look at the uh, spatial concepts uh, from the users, from the pilgrims, from the local uh, people, and look from this side towards the development of the architecture. So back to my presentation. It's uh, on uh, Eastern Austrian perspective regarding upgrading the vernacular. And therefore, I would like to start with um, vernacular uh, in a sense of historic and traditional architecture from various regions in Eastern Austria and at the end uh, give some future perspective. So Eastern Austria is made up of three of the nine provinces, Lower Austria, Vienna and Burgenland, and borders four countries, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary and Slovenia, with which Eastern Austria shares many building traditions. This region is an apt example of how, in vernacular architecture, national borders can be relatively meaningless and we need to think in terms of cultural regions. So this part is the Eastern Austrian part. Eastern Austria shown here in blue. So is diverse in itself in various respects and differs above all from the bordering federal provinces in Austria in the West much more than from the nation-states bordering the East. The climate is milder in or at the edge of the Pannonian Plain. The topography, topography is gentler, partly flat land. Geologically, it also differs from the neighboring limestone Alps to the West due to the immense deposits of clay. As a result, it is traditionally a clay building region. In some areas, such as in southern Burgenland, this, whoops, 
This is about here. Entire farmhouses were built of clay as late as the 1920s, although wood was the main construction method until the end of the 18th century. I will guide you through several Eastern Austrian regions with rather different building typologies and some historical and socio-economic background. So according to the numbering here on the map, number one is the Mostviertel, which is suitable for field and dairy farming due to its good soil and topography. It is one of Austria's most elite farming regions, which is reflected in the development of certain farmhouse structures. In the 19th century, it was, among other things, the trade insider that brought prosperity. Number two, the alpine foothills, where grazing livestock predominate at altitudes of about 800 meters. Then the number three, I will very shortly touch Vienna, the capital, in which many vernacular traces have been preserved. Number four, the Weinviertel, whose name follows the cultivation of wine and the rural culture associated with it. Number five, the Southern Burgenland on the border to the Alpine foothills, that means towards the west. And number six, the Southern Burgenland on the border to Hungary. First, the Mostviertel. The Mostviertel is a good illustration of the continuous transformation of vernacular. Until the beginning of the 19th century, wooden constructions were predominant, especially wooden beams which were wrapped with straw clay for ceilings and walls. With an economic upswing in the 19th century, it was possible to employ Mainly, mainly northern Italian workers to fire bricks in the field kilns and to have immensely large farmhouses built, the largest of which have sites up to 120 meters. A problem today is the size of the farmhouses. In this specific case, which is shown here, a childless couple, farmer, lives alone on this farm that has become far too large to live uh, and to live on without servants and without a large family for which it was actually designed. The alternating layer of fire bricks and river stones is a technique special for this region. The representative facade of the residential wing was plastered. The other facades remained unplastered. In terms of factory farming, so he is also producing um, eggs and many, many chicken, this farm became too small. So a large hole for chickens was added. So this is the actual farmhouse and uh, due to uh, not enough space they built this really ugly hole for chicken. The buildings are two-storied with an additional large attic for storing hay. Grain is not stored in individual granaries but in, first floor, in the first floor of the farmhouse. In the Franciscan cadaster from 1826, which you see here, the houses are shown in solitary location. They are scattered settlements with long access routes between the farms. <coughs> the fields are situated around the farms. To understand the ground plan of these farmhouses, which follow a rather similar pattern, um, 
we have one uh, ground floor, one first floor, and uh, what I want to point at is the entrance part. We have a corridor uh, and the living part and the kitchen. So it was former the fire part, the black kitchen. And this leads us to the courtyard. We have the stables and here uh, the storage places and the fields are in the surrounding. So please remember particularly these interim parts, living and kitchen for the next example. So this example is already in the pre-alpine region uh, at um, agriculture uh, altitudes of about 800, 900 meters. And the farmhouses here are up to about 300 meters apart from each other and they are also nestled in the fields. So what you see here, these are rather spread around this area, the farmhouses. In the Franciscan Cadastre, uh, it is shown uh, the division of the land ownership as it was already mentioned in the 18th century and which is still uh, corresponding to the field structure today. The size of all fields together corresponds to a half Huber a Huber which was a unit for the size of fields or also uh, 15 hectare. In contrast to the lowlands, the wood from the alpine pastures was used here for timber log construction. The site is located along a slope which is reflected in the choice of the building material. In this case we have in the um, um, uh, ground floor, um, solid stone construction, uh, here we have a log construction, timber log construction, and here wattle and daub. The fireplace, which is located next to the smoke kitchen, we also call it the black kitchen, is made of wood. Over many years the smoke kitchen was a tourist spot for families, particularly on weekends, but now it is not used therefore anymore due to legal restrictions. The house was used for living until the 1990s. The owner built a residential house next to it for better living comfort. And the old farmhouse, which is one of the last of its kind, could easily be demolished in the event of a change of ownership. Here the ground plan, and you remember before from the flat areas, the corridor, the living space, and the kitchen. So this is something like uh, a building typology, although the whole other structure of the farmhouse is completely different. Uh, here it's vertically organized, so uh, below this uh, part, this living part, you have the stable and the storage places and above you have the chambers for living and for sleeping. For sleeping. So um, interesting here is also the integration of the black kitchen, the smoke kitchen here. Uh, with the air circulation when fire is on, the warm Air is going up uh, through the ceiling and warming the sleeping uh, chamber up there and the smoke is going through a hole above the door and leaving through this wooden chimney. The cold air is going downwards and the air circulation from below brings the air up again and the whole circle starts again. The Weinviertel, it's the next region. This neighborhood is located along Moravia and Slovakia. The soil here is loess, which favored the development of earthen building techniques. The building is constructed of earth bricks, so this building in particular, and 
here in this region we find mainly single-story buildings. In the course of the renovation of this building, all floors were removed and will be replaced with a diffusion open insulated floor structure with underfloor heating. A heat pump with geothermal heat recovery was chosen as the heating system. All box windows were renewed. The yeah, here you see the courtyard uh, of this farmhouse, this former farmhouse, which is now reused as a residential building. And here the Franciscan cadaster from 1822. It uh, shows this village having been planned along a street. It refers to a village structure where mainly German-speaking colonists settled in the late Middle Ages. The strips of arable land were part of the three-field economy at the time and were connected to the barn area in the farmhouse. So what we will see also at later examples, we have here the common space, in this case it's a road, in other uh, cases it's a village green. Then we have rather parallelly shaped the single farmhouses. In the back side we have storage uh, places or the barns. And then we have the, the narrow, long fields, in German also called as Streifenflur. Here a ground plan, and we see the difference to the ground plan from before. Uh, here is the roads, uh, here the entrance to the courtyard, and from the courtyard you enter the central space, which was in the former times, the earlier times, the fireplace. Here you have the living part, the, called the Stube, and here you had the chamber, and then following the stables. And this is the archetypical free partition in this region, in the whole Eastern uh, Austrian region. Next, um, we jump shortly to Vienna. Formerly, independent villages were situated along the center of Vienna. These villages became part of Vienna from the second half of the 19th century onwards. These are mainly villages with a village green, as we can also find them in the Weinviertel, as we saw before, or in Burgenland, as we will see later on. On the Franciscan Kadaster from 1819, we can see a similar structure as uh, explained before at the example in Weinviertel. In the center, the village green. So here, the common area, the village green, farmhouses parallelly organized, uh, and some economic spaces with the stables uh, um, and the barns, and then the striped fields. Today, this village is only recognizable in fragments. It's the part of the 22nd district in Vienna, and this is what it looks like. And when we look rather closely, we can see some remaining uh, structures uh, which point towards their earlier use as farmhouses. Now we go in the center of Vienna, uh, and we also come across the oldest village green in Vienna. It has been built over and completely transformed over the last 1,000 years, but the traffic routes have been preserved. These define its original layout. Today the headquarters of the Austrian Academy of Sciences is located in the center of this village green. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is um, the former village green. Uh, these are the two passing uh, routes. Here have been the farmhouses and here have been the fields. Here is the academy. 
Next, we enter towards South Burgenland. The next example takes us to Southern Burgenland near the former border between Hungary and Austria. The building is made of fire bricks and was erected in the 19th century. The plaster cut on the front of the building, you see here, goes back to craftsmen who brought this facade decoration from the bourgeoisie of the city back to the countryside. The farmland was not further divided for reasons of inheritance, which is why it has twice the width of many farms of this type in southern Burgenland. So when you remember yesterday, uh, we saw some of rather narrow uh, courtyards. We also find this in Burgenland. This uh, is a result of inheritance. The village was laid out according to plan, but in this case the hilly topography did not allow the creation of a village green as we saw before. Here the ground plan. This is the courtyard. We enter the courtyard from here and again this three partition. Here the central fireplace, here the Stube, the living part, and here the chamber and further uh, rooms. Here a section, we enter from here, again this three division, it was a socially uh, higher standing uh, farmhouse, so we have vaults, a vaulted cellar, and also here a vaulted chamber. And the uh, last uh, final example is in Heiligenbrunn, located close to the today's Austrian-Hungarian border. In the cellar compound of this village, so here we are not talking uh, in contrast to the other uh, shown examples uh, about residential houses uh, or farmhouses, here we're talking about uh, wine cellars. So, in the cellar compound of this village, there are over 200 wine cellars. This makes this cellar lane one of the largest at all. In a project that has now lasted two years, we will soon complete the building documentation in this place. Traditionally, these cellars were built above ground for wine storage. See picture on the left. These were built as wooden log buildings. So most of the farmhouses in the uh, South Burgenland are, uh, were made as log buildings until the late 18th century. This name refers to, uh, yeah. Um, on the right picture, you can see a development in the 19th century when the cellar was partially dug into the ground. It is locally known as Kellerstöcke. This name refers to having a cellar on the one hand and an upper floor on the other hand. What is interesting and important to know is uh, the wine cellars which we have in southern Burgenland have not fully been dug into the ground due to a uh, high content of sand and gravel. And this is a big difference to the wine fiddle in the northeastern part, uh, which I showed before, where we have uh, pure loess, and there it was possible to dig fully into the ground. And this geological uh, precondition uh, also um, was a kind of uh, um, uh, um, of the need of finding different architectural typologies for the cellars. So here we have uh, the ground plan of how these cellars can look like. Similar to the farmhouse, we have a rest room, we have a pressing room, we have a storage room, and here is the uh, system with the cellar below. Uh, if someone wants to know more, we uh, wrote a peer-reviewed article, uh, the impact of clay minerals on the building technology of vernacular earthen architecture 
in Eastern Austria where these differences are very well explained. So in this case, again, we have the farmhouse structures parallelly uh, organized with the striped fields and the um, wine uh, yards are here where the topography is slightly rising. Uh, future perspectives, um, we uh, do not have um, any regulations or protections for vernacular architectures uh, in Austria, so a lot if is pulled down. We have um, earth building techniques tradition uh, from um, rammed earth to cob walls to uh, earth lump walls to clay uh, brick walls to um, uh, to um, wooden frame uh, walls uh, with clay infilled and to wetl and daub. Various uh, possibilities uh, we have or we are working on uh, the improvement of insulation uh, using renewable material, so we are quite successful in doing that and also regarding the acceptance by the owners of the building. Uh, so we are uh, working in general with water, uh, with uh, vapor open uh, construction techniques and we can uh, drastically reduce uh, the uh, thermal uh, uh, insulation, uh, so for example here in the wall, uh, we bring it down to one-third of the original uh, um, uh, thermal insulation and also the floor, we bring it down to even one-seventh of the original insulation. And uh, we uh, do practical training for uh, architects, for craftspeople, also for our students at the university on mainly earth, earth building techniques. And the last thing with the last two slides I want to show uh, is on, or it was a question to myself uh, regarding uh, what can be the future of the vernacular residential uh, buildings in Eastern Austria. And uh, since I'm working for the uh, province government uh, doing consultation for uh, house owners, uh, I have a rather good overview about the <coughs> needs of house owners and about their questions. And uh, now uh, I had 65 um, consultations and I made a kind of a statistics uh, out of these consultations of the results. Uh, and please just look at those which are framed in red. So we are talking about 65 vernacular residential objects. Uh, out of these, 54 will be renovated. Out of these, 40 are from the 19th century. So that means uh, without any... Um, uh, um, what I showed here, uh, any moisture barrier. So we can easily work with the vapor open uh, techniques. Then the next point is 40 of the 65 will do a full renovation. So owners are willed to spend their money. Such a full renovation is between 200 and 400,000 euros. So it's rather expensive to keep these old buildings. Oops. So the last two beams. Uh, heat pump. About half of the owners will have, won't have heat pumps in their future. And maybe something that's quite important is new insulation, either on the outside or the inside, will be conducted at two-thirds of the buildings. So it will change either the inside or outside design of the vernacular buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hubert.
Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping uh, the time frame. Um, um, and thank you for this insight for the situation in the present and the, the perspective to the future in the East uh, Austrian situation. Our next presenter is Martin Czernanski, and I don't know the, the name I pronounce well, Czernanski, uh, from the Czech Republic. So the floor is yours, and the, the rules are the same. So if you want to have questions, then please uh, finish a little bit earlier. Otherwise, you, kept, you have uh, 30 minutes, and before five minutes, uh, I will show yeah, I think Okay. So I use it, this microphone. Um, uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to my presentation. First of all, I would like to thank Danesh for the invitation. It is honor for me to be here in such a good atmosphere. Uh, as you can see, uh, my presentation is about vernacular architecture from the sustainability point of view and especially uh, from the point of climate, uh, climate condition and in connection with this climate uh, change. I hope that by the end of my talk you will be a little more familiar if I uh, am successful in this topic from uh, my position uh, at the National Heritage Institute. Uh, the examples are from Czech Republic because it is the <coughs> easiest way how to, how to show you. So now I will turn to short over overview. About, about this topic, uh, uh, my presentation is divided into three main stages. Of course, first of all, some general information uh, is mentioned. Secondly, uh, the building or the parts are described, including the most common natural phenomena. Of course, I had to uh, uh, leave landscape and settlements, although it is also very important to pay it would, it would be benefit to start the landscape and then settlements and in the end about the building themselves. So, and thirdly, uh, some conclusion will be followed in the end of my short talk. I begin with the well-known features of the vernacular architecture and its sustainability. It doesn't matter if in connection with the topical energy efficiency of buildings, with another topic like uh, ecological burden and so on, not to speak of cultural identity, which is, uh, I think, a uh, crucial topic for us. Uh, in addition to that, you can see other lessons or learning uh, method from method and knowledge uh, from the local uh, tradition. So I think that is very important. I show something about cultural diversity and diversity of function, form, and so on. You can uh, see uh, several pictures. I think that is important, for example, to uh, repeat it, uh, use, for example, some beams or hinges and so on. It was quite common, of course, because it was quite expensive. It was not a colloquial approach at the time, maybe, but it was about uh, saving energy, saving uh, money, saving resources. So also about, about uh, stable layout as can be shown on another example. So now uh, I would like to remain that there is no doubt that in many ways the use of building material is of primary importance, whether it is about construction, shape, form, burning capacity, thermal insulation, and so on, for example, fire resistance. As we can notice, despite this, despite of the material, <coughs> the stable layout and traditional regional form can be uh, seen on uh, photos on the left. Because of stable position of the chimney, it means the kitchen, stable position of <coughs> other um, part of the house, for example, a porch, a gate, and so on. So it looks very similar, although uh, it was uh, some changes, especially according to flammable material, and so on. 
Uh, I think that this is enough now for the introduction. Uh, just to general to say that in the Czech Republic, although we are a very small country, we use all the techniques which are known in other countries. Uh, we use uh, other uh, earth for this, we use timber, also we use uh, stone, and later it breaks, it differs uh, according to a region, according to a local of course, uh, local conditions, according to situation in some uh, big center or not, and so on. So now uh, a few examples will follow to show the issue uh, in relation to climate uh, uh, change, or in general maybe climate condition at the time, and um, adaptation of buildings which are exposed not only to uh, climate impact, but also uh, are exposed to another, another social phenomena and another um, issue. Uh, the first example is about some homestead, uh, and this homestead was rebuilt at a safe distance from, the, from some river in the Czech Republic. This retreat from the floodplain and ice flows took place at the beginning of uh, 18th century, 1716, 716 uh, exactly, and many beams from the earlier house and bar one was used again. Um, I checked the map of today's, uh, today's flood active zone and the <coughs> location of the um, homestead is almost exactly above the nowadays active zone of uh, uh, the flood area as well as uh, the flood zone for Q100. It means 100 water level and flow rate. It's exactly, it is, not based, it is not based on measurement but on local experience. So I think that uh, we can uh, lesson from this, from this knowledge of the uh, local condition with, without some uh, measurement or something like, like this. Uh, another example is concerned walls and temperature, for example. We discuss a lot of about insulation today and uh, the days before. Uh, for example, all timber houses have high pitch gable roof, and this roof overhanging the facade facing sunny sides. Of course, it was already said it has uh, something to do with inclination, the position of some sun in the summer and in the, in the winter. So wall, the walls made of beams were covered with doubt. In the Czech Republic, it is called fur coat. And it is not just because of thermal insulation, but there was another, another reason for this. Uh, the reason was anti-fire protection, regardless of the possible causation of the fire. Except for this, the appearance come to close the masonry building. So there are another reason, not just protection against the fire, and also something to, to deal with some, uh, with some uh, rules and other, other restrictions uh, to, um, to show uh, the house as a made of masonry, although you can see it made uh, completely, uh, completely of timber because uh, uh, beams are overhanging and it can be seen. So it was about uh, walls, about temperature, about anti-fire protection. Uh, another uh, example was concern facing, facing of the, uh, of the walls. Usually lamp paint was prevalent, reflecting more sunlight, and for that reason reducing heat gains. The heat gains uh, in this case was lava in comparison to black color, for example. Uh, in the case of timber structures, it was also used as wood preservative. Uh, the, li the lime, I mean. Uh, lime wash also allow walls to qu quickly dry out, for example, after flooding, because of the permeability of the lime. 
So I think it was quite common in many, many uh, region f uh, because of the properties of the lime and lime wash. Just a, mo just a moment. On this picture, in this picture, you can see that it is uh, the old timber house, but the front facade was uh, newly rebuilt, made of masonry, which is, was quite common because, for example, because of moisture and sometimes because of aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic. Now I would like to highlight uh, the importance of shutters. Uh, against, for example, heat, wind, as well as against rain. Wood the shutters we could see uh, also yesterday on our field, field trip uh, hung on pivot hinges on the exterior. Movable slats allow the setting, setting of different degrees, different angles uh, in relation to shading and also in relation to airing if the windows behind them is open. These shutters also allow for complete closure, for example, in windy and rainy weather as a windstorm or hailstorm protection. So it is another example how to use the then knowledge about uh, vernacular architecture, about uh, traditional dwellings uh, in villages. So another uh, example concerning opening is examples uh, in relation to interior uh, in the building, not just on the exterior, like in case of the shutters, but also in the interior of the building. You can see a window sill responding to the vapor condensation. There is a connection to the dew, dew point. Saturated air was captured on the cold glazing and its liquid st state was collected in the, a dry cup. Uh, this dry cup was placed under the wooden stool. The stool was provided with the profile or with the, with the grooves going to a hole drilled through the stool. So condensation water harvesting uh, I think it is very, very interesting example of the then knowledge and house operation. In many cases, we forgot um, uh, some knowledge about the how operation in the house. And basically, I think it is uh, very, very similar to today's air handling unit and reuse system. And I think that it is good to know about it, uh, that our ancestor were uh, well, clever about many, many physical phenomena, not just uh, in our age. So this is another example I would like to show. Uh, the next one um, is uh, in relation to, to roof. To, um, I would like to point attention to this part of, of, the, of the building. Uh, all timber houses usually have high pitch roof covered with shingles and a roof in some areas overhanging not just south facades because of south but also overhanging all facades especially in some highlight areas uh, and besides heavy precipitation a mantle of snow uh, was taken into account so uh, overhanging one was on all facade. Apart from undergable rooflet, as can be seen in the picture, the half hip, or sometimes just third hip, was at the top of the decorative timber gable. And this, this hip was done also with the consideration of the, of the, of the wind, because it was, uh, um, how to say, uh, the top of the gable was removed and the shape was smoother was smooth in comp uh, against, against wind. So also you can see small openings for ventilation in the decorative gable and uh, this is also, it was good for natural airing on the, on the loft, on the space under, under the roof and also this small opening reduced the wing stress, the, the load from the wing 
on this uh, gable. In relation to the, to the shape, I think the roof frame was also very, very important. As far as stability is concerned, the principal roof thrust was structurally rigid due to its triangular form. It was quite typical uh, to use triangle also from the uh, stability point of view. Beside this, further cross and especially longitudinal wind bracing were used as a common occurrence in all types of the roof as we could seen before. In the case of snow cover, high pitch roofs are also better compared to, for example, flat roofs because uh, it was much easier uh, to, um, for snow to fall down. Uh, another <coughs> example um, is about co co covering because I think that the covering time was equally important like structure so at the same time it was important what to put on the, on the, uh, on the roof truss. As the example, a polygonal barn was covered by uh, churches and shingles, the eaves and the ridge. ridge is shown because uh, I think that there is no need to remind here that in both cases it was uh, a highly flammable, flammable material easy to soak in the wet. An adaptation to climatic condition concerning the material is evident here from the location, form and stability. Firstly, it concerns the risk of fire because usually these um, uh, barn covered with thrashes <coughs> and shingles was standing alone and later when it was covered by tiles it can go close to the other, bu other buildings of the farmstead. So this is uh, a risk of fire. Secondly, the risk of precipitation and wind. Uh, it can be seen because they were high pitch, uh, more than other type of the buildings. And sometimes you can see that this polygonal barn were round shaped, shaped at the, at the ends because of wind. So it was another reason, not just to curve fast uh, for, for uh, rain da rainfall down, but also some aerodynamic shape against a wind. Thirdly, of course, there was a long walls, and inside inside this barn, of course, a lot of uh, roof bracing to uh, ensure the stability. Um, before conclusion. I would like to show one more example as the exception confirming the rule in our case. Although the low pitch roof are seldom found on the territory of the Czech, today's Czech Republic, there is an exception in, very, in this very small area uh, in South Bohemia. Here the Alpine type houses appeared together with the foreign settlers, of course, uh, whether from Bavaria or even mm, far away. And on these treeless plains, the shingle roofs with a shallow pitch were overstressed, maybe um, more than pressure by uplifting. Uplift uh, because of wind, and because of that, the wooden sticks placed over, over, the, uh, over the shingles. Uh, were weighted down by stones, as you can see on, on, the, on the right and in, in the middle. So there were stones and another sticks to weigh, weigh down uh, the um, uh, covering of, of, the, of, the, of the roof. So uh, this is very, very important, of course, because of harsh climate, the log walls were covered with shingles, shingles too but otherwise it's, I think it was common in another, for example, mountains region and, and so on. So finally, I would like to point out that the vernacular architecture 
has always been well adapted to local climate condition. Yeah, I think that this is a general rule, not counting natural disaster, of course, it's like today's. So, but adaptation was the necessity, if I would could, if I uh, could say. So, um, paradoxically, much more damage in the cultural monuments can be still attributed uh, not to condition, climate condition, but to lack of maintenance, to improper use or no use, and especially to mal maladaptation. Unfortunately, often in the connection uh, with adaptation to climate change. However, the number of cultural heritage loses due to climate change itself is also increasingly alarming without doubt. And thank you very much for your listening. Yeah, here I'm so my contacts and thank you very much for attention.